the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for December 4th, 2017. Uh, first thing on the agenda is public comment period. Anybody wishing to make public comment? Yes, ma'am, come on up. Right up to there. Give us your name and your address. Right over here, please. And if you could please give us your name and your address. Good evening, everybody. My name is Helena Sorensen. My address is 7 Green Street, Hampton. But uh, basically, I just wanted to come. I happen to have to come back up here for uh, family reasons. But I wanted to come over and personally thank everybody on the board for all their efforts and to have the warrant articles issued and reissued and that there's going to be action and there's efforts going on now to resolve our problem in the flooding area of Green Street, Genton and Meadow Pond. Of course, it's still there. It hasn't gone away. I checked it out this evening. It's all there. But uh, I want to thank you, everyone. Uh, thank all, everybody here. That's thank it. you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Anybody else wish to make a uh, public comment? <coughs> Charlie? <coughs> Uh, John Crescent, 47 Glade Path. Um, number one on the town manager's report. I want to say thank you for your action last week on Ashworth Ave, parking lot. There's going to be a learning curve. We're going to get it done. <coughs> the state has also said they're going to try to do some stuff with the CPA lot in the north of the Ashworth. They're going to try to see if they can get a system going. And um, I just want to say thank you for that. And maybe next year we'll go even further. Maybe next year we'll get rid of the parking ban where you don't have, you know, I'll allow people from pocket for 120 days when it's really maybe 20 events. So, but we're going forward, and I want to thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to make public comment? Good evening, Mary Louise Woolsey, 148 Little River Road. I have a lot to run by you, and I'll do it quickly uh, because it's all pretty much interconnected. Uh, I said at your last meeting that uh, the manager has been saying that we're getting nothing done. Uh, all we do is pick up trash. Uh, if you noticed on the town screen, uh, there was a memo <coughs> warning residents that they might not get their recycling picked up because of breakdown and repair needs in the Public Works Department. I understand from the manager that we expect to lose about 17 employees in the Public Works Department in the next two years, and that is going to cause problems for the department. You'll have people going upstairs, but you'll be losing um, long-time uh, employees, and that will hurt. Um, short staffing results in a lot, a loss of, of work being accomplished. Um, I was not happy to see that in the Hampton Union. We, it looks like a third. Could you explain that a little? I can't see it. It's like a third world country. This is the treatment plant. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank Very you. Louise. Thank you. You let Charlie speak five minutes last week. Let's not be Look, quite so. Just keep it rolling, please. Um, <coughs> Fred, do we have all the manpower that we need? We and don't interact. Works? Public comment, you make yes, public comment. Yes, yes, I know. Thank you. I know. Please stick what to we're it. doing is you're asking the public for a $15 million bond in March. We're, we're doing all these renovations. You're asking the public for money, and you've got the conditions at that public works department that are reflected in the wastewater facilities plan. I strongly suggest to you, A, that you stop the collection of, of waste from commercial entities at that beach. You've got to stop that. You're killing the public works department. You're spending a lot of money 
on vehicles and uh, other accessories for the Public Works Department that they would not need. The time has come to stop collecting commercial trash. We're under no obligation. It, it shouldn't and never have been started. And then Wright Pierce's report caught my eye because the heading on this says, Selectmen I billing residents for sewer. Really? On page 2-11 in here, <laughs> it says, really quickly, there it is. The impact of increased industrial pollutant loading plays a significant role in the remaining <coughs> capacity of the treatment plant, both for current and projected wastewater conditions. Based on the existing design capacity, the brewery may be contributing anywhere from 10 to 40 percent of the plant's overall pollutant load capacity. And then it has suggestions, and the third suggestion says apply an industrial surcharge fee for permitted industrial users to account for the cost of treating higher concentration wastewater stream. It seems to me that this should have been done certainly when Smutty Nose came online. If there is an industrial surcharge fee that is allowable, I think you certainly ought to be looking into it and fast because there are other industrial users as well and finally, on page 2-17, it says, as sewer mains and the town's collection system continue to age, inflow will likely increase. Replacing and or rehabilitating aging sewer mains and services in Ray the Louise, system I've given you the same amount minute, of time that will Charlie be an had. important Five minutes. will be an Thank important you. component of the town's overall Thank asset please. management strategy. It says the industry standard is to annually invest from 0.3 percent to one percent of the replacement value of the collection system to maintain the overall integrity of the system. For the town, this would equate to approximately 800000 to $1.6 million you. a year. You've got Thank to you. do, you've got to do better. You. You've got to do better with this Public Works Department. Yes, thank you very much. You've got, yes, I know. I know. And if, at some point thank in you. time, if one could sit down and have a civilized discussion with the board, that might be very nice. Thank you very much. Anybody else wishing to make public comment? Seeing none, we will move to uh, announcements and community calendar. Uh, Regina? Uh, nothing at this time, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, the fact we had a, a great tree lighting this week and a, uh, a wonderful Christmas parade. It was good to see everybody out there. It was good to see all the, uh, the businesses and, and groups that participated. and. Uh, <laughs> You know, we also got to thank the voters who, who supported it with the Warren article last year. So uh, thank you to everybody. I think it was one of the best attended parades we've had in a long time here. Mr. Griffin? No, um, nothing. Did they have singers at the uh, tree lighting? Uh, they had a, uh, um, a, a DJ there that was doing music and stuff for the tree lighting. But there was, there was five or six uh, restaurants and a couple of organizations that were giving out snacks and and stuff, so it was really well attended. There's probably over a thousand people at the tree lighting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bean? Negative, sir. Thank you. Okay, I would just like to reiterate that the uh, Christmas parade was one of the best uh, ever, I think, in Hampton. It was well attended. The tree lighting was super. It was really well attended. And uh, if anybody sees Santa Claus, they should wish him well because he has a sore shoulder. All right, so moving on. Appointments. John Herlihy. Dan Lawrence and Carl McMorran, Aquarian Water Company, APFC Studies. Gentlemen. Don't all jump up at once. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. I'm John Walsh, uh, Vice President of Operations for Aquarian. Uh, thank Sorry you. I didn't introduce you. They didn't have your name on the list here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so thank you for having us here this evening. Uh, so you've mentioned two of the folks that are here with us this evening. First of all, uh, John Herlihy, our Vice President of Water Quality and Environmental Management. Uh, behind me, you'll hear also from Dan Lawrence, our Director of Engineering and Planning. Uh, just to my right here is Alan Huth. He's our Manager of Capital Projects. 
in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, and Carl McMorrin, whom you all know, who's our manager of operations uh, in New Hampshire, and also Brian Mills uh, is in the back of the room here. He is our um, community relations uh, person. Uh, so this evening, John Hurley and Dan Lawrence are going to provide you with an update um, on the concentration of PFCs, uh, those are per fluoro compounds, uh, that we are finding in our wells and in the water that we deliver to you. We're also going to provide you with a summary of the alternatives to address the PFCs, and we'll provide you with the costs <coughs> associated uh, for those alternatives. So this work reflects our commitment uh, to you and to our customers to understand the level of PFCs in the water and to evaluate the alternatives uh, to address the PFCs. And with that, I will hand it over to John Hurley. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity to provide this update on our PFC monitoring results. Uh, first, just a quick refresher on where the water comes from in the Hampton, Northampton, Rye public water system. Uh, so in the upper left, we have the Winnicott Road well field, seven individual wells that are all uh, piped together. They blend or mix within the treatment facility and then in enter the distribution system piping at one individual point. Uh, to the right, we have well 5A in Rye. Uh, we have well 14 in Northampton and well 7 in the lower <coughs> right in Hampton. Those are individual wells one well uh, producing water into uh, the distribution system. And then we have six wells at Mill Road, uh, and they enter the, the distribution system at four separate points all along Mill Road. So wells 8A, 20, and 21 come together and mix or blend uh, in the existing treatment facility, enter the Mill Road pipe. Well, 6, 9, and 11 enter that Mill Road distribution pipe individually, so three separate uh, entry points. We've been uh, monitoring water quality in these wells in 2017 uh, since June. Uh, we now have five rounds worth of data. Uh, in addition to these points, we've been monitoring six locations in the distribution system since August. And uh, I'll be presenting you with an update on those findings, both the October results and the year-to-date results uh, now that we have, uh, we have about 950 data points now. We've collected 50-plus uh, samples, and each sample has been uh, tested for at least 14 different PFC compounds. So we're, we're close to 1,000 test results, so I think it's now appropriate to, to look at trending. So one of the new developments since uh, I was with you last month is that the laboratory that we're using can now use a method that will identify and quantify 26 different PFC compounds. From June through September, the method that they were using could uh, identify and quantify 14 compounds. So now that has increased to 16 compounds. Of those 16, uh, 26 compounds, nine have been detected, and these are the nine. So, Mr. Chairman, the, the full name is on the left. The abbreviation is in the middle. Thank you. <laughs> and the numbers on the right are the number of carbon atoms. So these PFCs are uh, carbon chains that have uh, different types of groups hanging off of them. Some of them are acid groups, some of them are sulfonate groups, as the names indicate. And the importance of the number of carbon atoms uh, is in treatment and Dan will get into that a, a little later. Uh, so looking at these uh, compounds, the, um, these are the only ones that we have detected. The, uh, looking at the second and third line of the perfluorooctanoic acid and the perfluorooctane sulfonate compounds with the eights, uh, those are the two that have limits in uh, New Hampshire, uh, US EPA, and Maine. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, so here I have those limits depicted. So that top line at 70 parts per trillion, that's EPA, New Hampshire, and Maine. Uh, and it's PFOA, PFOS, and the combination of the two. 
Uh, lower down on the graph at 20 parts per trillion is the standard that Vermont has just for PFOA. And a little below that at 14, uh, New Jersey has now proposed a maximum contaminant level for PFOA at 14. And they've also proposed a maximum contaminant level of 13 for PFNA. That was also, can you go back one, John? Uh, <coughs> PFNA is at the top of the list there, and we've only detected that in, in uh, two out of the more than 50 samples that we've collected, and both of those hits were at well six. Uh, so, um, so New Jersey moving forward with an MCL uh, for those two compounds, and they're also planning to do one for PFOS, and they're, they're looking at a number of 13 parts per trillion there. So that's a new development also. These are proposed at this point. But the main point is if you look at the bars there, each bar represents a different sampling event. On the right-hand side, you can see the dates. Uh, this is the delivered water. So this is the water that flows from the customer's taps. Uh, and you can see that the levels uh, of the PFOA and PFOS combined are low compared to uh, the current standard in New Hampshire and also the most conservative standard in the country, uh, which is New Jersey. And the second point I want to make is that the levels have been uh, very consistent over the uh, three months that we have been monitoring in the distribution system. All those numbers are less than 10. Okay, so quality is consistent. Uh, this is the same uh, type of samples, distribution system samples, the water that flows from the customer's tap. Now we're looking at total PFCs. So for most of the data, it was um, up to 14 compounds being analyzed. October set is 26 compounds. In the October set, they did detect two out of the 12 new compounds, two new compounds. So despite that, the uh, total PFC levels in the distribution system remained uh, consistent compared to previous month's results. So you can see most of those results there for the six different points. Uh, the first three are in Hampton, the next two are in Northampton, and then Rye on the end. Those uh, results, most of them are less than 10 for total PFCs, and then there are two samples at uh, Mill Road that are uh, a little above 10, but all uh, less than any standard that's out there. Next slide, please. Uh, now looking at the water in our production wells. And so this group here is the six mill road wells. And uh, the, bar, the bars on the left are well number six, where we find the highest level of contamination of any of our wells. Uh, so, uh, and again, just PFOA plus PFOS concentrations. You can see five uh, data sets there, and the numbers are, are all very similar to each other. So the October data set is the light blue one on the right, and uh, it's very similar to the previous months. And it's the same for the remaining five uh, mill road wells. Uh, only the, um, only the uh, mill uh, road number six well has combined uh, PFOA and PFOS above 20. All the rest of them are below 10. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is the total PFC picture for the Mill Road wells. And uh, even total PFCs, you can see for five of the six wells, relatively low. Well six has levels that are between uh, 60 and 80, typically, and then most recently, in the October set, the total PFC number jumps up by about 40 parts per trillion, and that's because one, uh, two, of the, the, two of the 12 new compounds were detected, and one of them uh, was detected at around 30 parts per trillion. Next. Uh, this slide shows the remaining uh, wells, so the Winnicott Road well field on the left. You can see those total PFC numbers are very low, less than 10 low compared to any standard that's out there. Uh, same with well 5 and well 7. Well 14, we are picking up <clears throat> some PFC levels uh, north of 10 and even north of 20. And that 20, again, is with the expanded method. And we did pick up uh, uh, two of the new compounds there. 
this last slide that I'm going to present, this is what we're calling our fingerprint. So this is an average of all the data we've collected from well six this year. Along the, the horizontal axis there, you can see the uh, abbreviated names for the nine compounds <coughs> that we have detected out of the 26 tested for. And you can see uh, that the PFOA and PFOS are on the right there. And relative to the other, the levels of the other compounds detected, so the PF, uh, PEA, that is, that has the highest bar, and that's one of the new compounds detected. And you can see the column next to it, that's the second highest level compound detected. And the importance of this graph is that we are going to be uh, using this information in our work with New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services to compare what we're finding in well six to what is found in monitor wells in the area uh, where the con uh, in trying to determine where the contamination is coming from. So if we find contamination from a particular source that mirrors this fingerprint, uh, you know, with, with high levels of PFPE, for example, and very low levels of PFNA, uh, then that will help us to identify uh, where the contamination for well six is coming from. And we'll have fingerprints for each of our wells and then compare them to what we find in the aquifer. Um, I mentioned DES, uh, so we continue to work with them to plan uh, a monitoring round for uh, water quality out in the aquifer, so out beyond our production wells, what's, what's heading towards our production wells. Uh, we're finalizing an agreement with uh, New Hampshire DES. Uh, they are going to be performing the sample collection. They're going to be communicating with the residents that have private wells that we hope to sample. And Aquarion is going to be paying for the testing of those samples. Uh, and that's going to run approximately $20,000. Uh, when those results, those results will come into uh, New Hampshire DES and they'll be shared uh, with you all and the public, and then we will uh, see what we have in terms of understanding uh, where the camp contamination is coming from. And that's what I have for tonight. With that, we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Dan Lawrence, who's gonna talk about our evaluation of the treatment alternatives or the alternative methods for addressing the PFCs. Good evening. So thank you, John. It's uh, good to see we're moving along. So in, uh, no on November 6th of 2017, we provided a copy of our PFC treatment analysis, which is a really a conceptual analysis of both options for treatment as well as potential costs and potential rate impacts to the town. So tonight what I hope to do very briefly is kind of hit that at a high level and talk about a few things. So as we look at the potential for addressing uh, PFC contamination, we generally have three main options. There's the option to remove wells from service. There's the option to blend um, sources in the same well field typically um, to reduce concentrations, and you have to, the ability to treat the affected wells. So we looked at these. Um, we don't address taking well six out of service because well six is critical infrastructure to us, both from a, a volume standpoint and generally, as you know, we have it off, but we do need it during high demand periods, um, such as the summer. So I want to address um, the blending, which um, for those who understand blending is mixing. We, we do this now, right now. Um, well six, eight, uh, excuse me, well eight, A, 20 and 21 are in the same well field and they combine before they go into the distribution system. So those, those sources are combined. We do that at the Winnicott well field as well, where there's multiple wells there. They are blended already, not for the purposes of um, any reduction in contamination in, in, within a water supply, but it's just how the well field is constructed. So, so as we think about the Mill Road well field where we have the greatest level of contamination, you can see at the top right-hand corner, well, 8A, 20, and 21, they come out and hit the dis enter the distribution system in one location. Well, 6, 11, and 9 also come out into the distribution system in one location. So we have those separate entrance points. So the intention would be for, for us to combine, go ahead, John. combine all the wells and create one entry point into the system. This is important because then we can take, now this is part of our 
project related to chemical treatment. It's nothing to do with PFC treatment, but our intention, and we're in the middle of designing this, consolidation of these well fields, is um, so we're putting a chemical treatment facility and this uh, blue pipe that's going up here would take and combine wells 9, 11, 6, 8A, 20, and 21, and we'd have one treatment system for, for chemicals. So in the process, when we accomplish this, we'll be able to take the higher levels in well 6 related to PFCs and the lower levels associated with other wells, combine those sources and result in a lower, overall lower PFC level. So as you can see on the next slide, what we're hoping to show you here is what blending would have accomplished <coughs> at, at the Mill Road well field after com combination of all those wells. And you can see, and this is a little bit technical, so forgive me, but as John said, the acronyms are here. And remember PFOA and PFOS are regulated right now at 70 um, and also regulated by other um, entities, New Jersey, Vermont, um, as well. But we'd go down to 11 parts per trillion or nanograms per liter um, and a blended point entering the distribution system. The PFO would be a, a approximately 8 and PFAS, again, would be less than four because that's the maximum reporting level, and then the total um, PFC level would be at 40. Now that's based on our present, most recent sampling. This was updated since we have our October results. The report that I provided is a little bit behind this. So, is everyone, any questions on that before I move on? So mix the water, come up with a different concentration because they all have different concentrations. So we also looked at treatment technologies. And I'm not going to get overly technical tonight. Um, if we ever want to do that, I'll bring my consultant with me, who we hired, uh, Ty and Bond. So when you look at PFC treatment, and there are a number of facilities out there treating, um, you have granular activated carbon, which is an absorption technology, if you will. It absorbs the PFCs. An ion exchange um, concept, which actually, much like a <coughs> softener, um, exchanges with the resin, so you uh, uh, exchange chloride and you exchange with the PFCs to get onto the media, and then high pressure membranes. The two we looked at are granular activated carbon and the ion exchange, primarily because high pressure membranes really are for smaller waste streams. And um, when you look at it, it's like we talk about proven technologies because people have done and used granular activated carbon or GAC to treat P PFCs. Ion exchange is really in the newer developing stage. So when it says lower capital and annual operating costs, there's also a lot less data there. So I'm not really sure it's that much lower. It's probably comparable for all intents and purposes. But when you look out, uh, EPA has their um, guidance documents, they suggest it's lower and it's suggested to last a bit longer. But without a lot of background, it's sometimes hard to tell. So we looked at three treatment scenarios for both granular activated carbon and ion exchange. Uh, treatment scenario one is to treat just well six. That's the source with the highest contamination, as John Hurl, he just explained to you. That's approximately 360 gallons a minute. So we would treat just well six, and the remainder of the wells would still be consolidated and would enter the system together, but just treating well six. The second scenario would be you treat six, nine, 11, and AA. The significance of that is those are overburden wells or the ones in the sand and gravel. Um, and that seems to be where, <clears throat> that's where well six is, and so that, that kind of addresses that group. And then uh, scenario three for the Mill Road well field addresses all of the wells, which includes 20 and 21, which are bedrock wells. So you can look at kind of the magnitude of what you're treating. You're going from well six, and there's where we look at this at 360 gallons a minute, all the way up to 2,000 gallons a minute, and obviously costs increase as you look at that. So... You know, treatment does decrease. So again, what you have here is you have the PFOA, PFOS on the left-hand side, and then PFOA, PFOS, and then total PFCs, those combinations that are typically out there um, as ambient groundwater standards, health advisories, but proposed MCLs um, in various states and in various agencies. So blending again, you have that's your second column that shows you the 11, the 8, less than 4, and 40, which you just talked about. And so as we move one more column to the right, scenario one for PFC treatment of water, that's a well six. So the difference between blending for P, the combination of PFOA and PFOS, in blending we would have 11 parts per trillion, 
If we treated well six and none of the other wells, we would have six. So you, you, you can gain or lose, if you will, five parts per trillion through that process. And then the PFOA, PFAS in total. So significantly, um, the total PFC number goes from 40 in blending down to 18 if you just treat well six. Because the high, again, higher level concentrations are at well six, none of the other wells. And obviously, if you move on and you treat the overburden wells, which is where the PFCs are right now, it's some levels higher than others, those <coughs> result in essentially less than four. And the reason we re represent it as less than four is that's the maximum reporting limit. That's where the laboratory can detect two. And then, obviously, if you add two more wells that don't have PFCs in them right now, that, 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 that uh, holds true as well. So, so there's two scenarios that make some sense. Go ahead, John. I think this is the most important slide, and I don't want to spend too much time in the previous information. But so it goes, the top portion of this, the top four rows, are the information we just looked at, which gets you the con gives you the concentrations based on our present, <coughs> present reporting information that we'll be able to achieve for PFCs, PFOA, PFOA POFS, PFOS, excuse me. Um, and then the associated capital cost, annual operating cost, <coughs> and potential rate increase. So blending, and there's a footnote, because there is a cost to blending, it's just not part of PFC treatment um, because it's a part of another project we're already doing. Um, again, she's the 11 for total PF, PF, PFO and PFOS, 8 for PFOA, less than 4 PF, PFOS and 40, and, then, and there's no op additional operating cost for that. As you look into the next scenario, the next column over to the right, scenario 1, which is treating just well 6, is a capital cost, and again, these are we're at a high level right now. Think about flying in an airplane and you kind of get yourself down to land. Um, so we do have some variance in these numbers. We haven't fully designed it. We continue to find, um, with the expanded uh, list of contaminants as well, around $1.9 million for a capital cost. Again, building equipment, things like that. Um, an operation and maintenance cost about $100,000 uh, per year. The assumption is we'd have to change out the media once a year right now. As we progress the design, we'll be able to get a bit better determination on that and hopefully get beyond one year with media. And that results in a 5% rate increase. As we continue to move over, and I'll kind of combine scenarios two and three because you really wouldn't implement scenario two. Um, it's the savings between two and three, which seems a little strange. It has to do with piping, the existing piping configuration in the well field. It's more advantageous to combine all the wells than just the overburden wells. So that would get you to the point where you're removing PFCs as a whole. You'd have less than four parts per trillion or nanograms per liter. Um, again, our conceptual capital cost right now is about $5.7 million, um, multiple units. Um, still to be determined exactly what we're going to be doing, but that's where we are today with an annual operating cost of approximately $300,000. And again, based on... <clears throat> the analysis to get to the 16% rate increase is based on having to change media once a year. It's a really big, important thing. Um, and, and, and it all depends on John. Before, Hurley, he talked about those carbon chains. If you remember that list of carbon chains, which seems like, what is all that about? The more carbon chains we have, the more beneficial it is used to granule activated carbon. The less carbon chains we have, the shorter chains, the more beneficial um, ion exchange is. So we have a little bit of both, and so we'll be working on that. Last time I was here, we talked about funding opportunities. And so we have the Groundwater and Drinking Water Trust Fund. I am not going to read this to you, um, but you can feel free to, to look at it. I think the most important thing you take away from this is there is money out there. Um, it's not ready to be distributed in a unilateral way. I know there has been some projects that receive funding. There's $278 million. Um, uh, Carl reached out to Rick from DES. I talked to, the, I, I communicated with DES trying to understand who's in charge. Uh, Senator Chuck Morse is. There is a meeting on December 19th in 2017 that we'll be attending um, to understand it better, to understand both the rules. Right now, there's no guidelines or rules. Is it, there's a possibility that the program would be wrapped into the state revolving fund on that application process. So we're um, looking to do this. It's not the easiest information to find, to be honest with you, because it's not a program that's established. So 
um, hopefully that uh, the piece of information we received that grants are probable is maybe as high as 50%. That would be great. Uh, but we've got to figure out where that stands, when applications would be due. Uh, I think the last thing Carl was told when he talked to Rick was make sure you're agile and ready. And um, before I came to Aquarian, I was uh, in consulting, and I'm, I would say 90% of my, my job was to find money, to help communities find money. And us having a report puts us in a great position relative to funding. Not many people come to a, and apply with funding having even looked at anything. They just have a problem. So it's, it's nice we have some documentation from a third party, a consultant, that we can use if we're ready. So that's the end of my presentation. I tried to keep it briefer than this. We had a discussion this morning that was much more detailed, but at a high level. So open to questions, Chairman. Okay. Regina? So scenario three. So pretty much scenario two really, to me, wouldn't really be an option because <coughs> it's about the same amount of money. But as far as scenario three obviously is the ideal situation and getting funding would make it even more ideal. But we won't, it sounds like we're not too sure about when the funding will actually be available. Yeah. I mean, um, what we've been told, and again, this is just a discussion, right, not a well, pieces of paper available is that the, the next application could be as early as uh, early 2018, but there's no guarantee of that right now. So, And you're still working on an agreement with New Hampshire DES? Yeah, one of the things that is really important to us, and John talked about it, um, and I didn't bring the map, but we've selected approximately 50 locations throughout the community, um, and some a little bit, if you, if you will, left and right as well. Right now, there's not good data overall on where contamination might be coming from and what types of contamination. I mean, is there more of one compound than another that we're only seeing one fingerprint or profile? And we really would like to understand that better before we go and invest into, I think you would as well, making sure we're treating and we don't pick the wrong technology, we don't have the wrong assumptions going in. So we really want to make sure um, that we're moving in the right direction. So wouldn't it be perhaps beneficial to, when do you think that we could have all that testing? We're going to, mm -hmm. between you and DES, you're going to randomly pick a sample of well, send out notices to... Yeah, I can go through that if you'd like. Um, so right now we're finalizing a, uh, especially in contractual terms with New Hampshire DES because we have to have a contract so we can pay a piece, they can, they can <coughs> execute a piece. Um, that should be done, if all goes well, either before the end of the year or the first part of January. And then my guess is they, have a, they do have presently a staff, and their job is to call people, send notices, and arrange for appointment sampling. So that's something they do every day. Um, so once we have the contract, we're going out to bid for the uh, analytical results. That'll be in soon. So we're thinking, you know, the first quarter will be spent collecting that data. Um, and then get that data back. And then once we have that data, that data, as John mentioned, is going directly to the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. It's not coming to us directly. That's private well data. So it'll go to the DES. They will handle it like they handle all the rest of the data for the state. Um, we feel that's really important. Um, and once we have that data, everyone in the world's going to have it as well. Whoever wants it, we'll be able to share that with you guys. And so I think we'll have a much better handle on are there other sources of PFCs in the community. Um, you know, there is a number of, of landfills and various other things around besides Coakley that we're starting to see. I mean, there was an article um, about one of them. That it's important to understand your total, um, total contamination, where it's coming from, what potential sources will be. So as we look at this today, um, and as we proceed with our chemical treatment facility, um, we want to proceed with blending. Blending gives us uh, really, really good um, results. In the, in the short term in our, under our present uh, contaminant levels um, for PFOA, PFAS, and, and total PFCs. We believe that's a, a good solution in the short term as we try to figure out what's going to happen. Is there more PFCs, less PFCs? Where is it coming from and where it might get that? It also allows us to buy a little time relative to the funding sources <coughs> and, and establish that. Good. I'm good, thank you. Rusty? Sounds like with the blending they use the old adage, the best solution for pollution is dilution. <laughs> you know, that's uh, by blending it, you're, you're getting it down so it's in a better spot. It is, and, we're gonna, and I think the most important thing is we're not going to stop investigating at the same time. 
Good. We're going to continue to move in parallel as we have. So if there's things that change, you know, we'll be there with you. We'll let you know. And obviously, um, biggest concern is ours as well. So. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> We're depending on you to make sure that uh, things stay the way they need to be. Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Ballestero, uh, who has been uh, commissioned, if you will, to uh, serve us in his interest, testified 15 November uh, in Northampton uh, when they presented a, uh, a CLG brief uh, to the Northampton selectmen. Unlike uh, that brief, when the CLG came here, it was to respond to a conflict of interest uh, assertion uh, that was unanimously asserted by the board. Were any of you guys at that meeting in Northampton? You were there. Carl was there. Okay. Have you seen Dr. Ballesteros' uh, uh, synopsis of his comments? Yes, I you, have that. You have. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. I, I don't think blending is a good idea, but it's a very serious issue. Um, Dan, you've uh, responded to Minnie Messner and her, her uh, assertions about uh, levels of um, these carcinogens with New Jersey and Vermont, and I would, I would agree with her. But uh, Dr. Ballestero states um, about the challenge of some of this, this plume that's coming from Coakley, and nobody really knows where it's coming. But uh, again, to, uh, to uh, cogently address this issue, this is from Dr. Ballestero, who's been commissioned through our legal department by the Board of Selectmen to serve as the scientist for our be behalf. This past summer, a public water supplier, which was Aquarian, had one of its major wells shut down due to PFC contamination. The supplier provides drinking water to Hampton, Northampton, and Rye. The well that has been lost produced just over 65 million gallons of water per year. Now, you remember, importantly, that we came within a few percent of not meeting demand last summer. So that would be extremely problematic if it uh, continues to be that challenge. This was an overburdened well. Nearby, there were four other aquarium wells, some bedrock that combined to pump an additional 219 million gallons of water. So we've got a cluster of wells that predominantly support our water supply, and one of them has been shut down. And I think that is a very serious issue. I know it is. The Coakley Landfill Group studies have clearly demonstrated there is an intimate connection between overburden and bedrock groundwater. The combined draw from these wells is manifested in the U.S. Geological Survey's modeling studying results. Recently, this water supply has recognized it as insufficient supply and storage to meet the immediate and growing water needs for these three communities it serves. Those are Dr. Ballesteros' words. Those are fairly ominous. The shutdown of well six, which applies between four and five percent of Aquarian systems, has exacerbated and magnified this water shortage. Aquarian is now actively seeking to put online a bedrock well in the same vicinity as its other wells and has been approved to conduct pumping tests at a rate in excess of 1.3 million gallons of water daily. DES has recognized that PFC contamination may be drawn into this well and is requiring monitoring for this and other contaminants. The communities served by aquarium and water and by private wells are now caught in the precarious position of not owning a water company and residing immediately down gradient of the landfill plume. The communities are requesting additional modeling wells to the south of the landfill in line with the source area, wellhead, of the shutdown well and other production wells. The initial regulatory response to this request is that the Coakley Landfill Group, the Coakley Landfill rather, is not the source of PFCs that shut the well down. Yet all of the groundwater data that exists argues against this simplistic conclusion. In addition, the regulatory response has been that there are other PF sources much closer to the shutdown well. While this may be true, the PFC concentration in the well is cumulative metric. It represents the totality of all sources. Neither the CLG nor the regulatory community have demonstrated that PFCs did not come from the Coakley Landfill Group. Or the Coakley landfill, and that such a source is not what resulted in the shutdown well concentration to exceed regulatory limits. The request for additional monitoring wells is technically based in the data. The cost of the wells and their monitoring are not onerous are not an onerous burden on the CLG in comparison to their present day annual expense. So you see he's arguing the CLG and not Aquarian picks up this tab. 
Such monitoring needs are not indefinite and will serve either to support or reject the present-day conceptual hydrological <laughs> model for the landfill plume. If the community well contamination found in the Coakley monitoring wells is due to Coakley landfill, not only is the money well spent, but it helps communities determine how best to address the problem. This goes on and on and on, but it, uh, it's got two more par paragraphs. It says, the requested monitoring to well should be well couplets that assess conditions in overburden and bedrock strata. It gets a little technical, but in summary, our scientist uh, says, in summary, telling communities that they're below an action level of risk for cancer is not satisfactory, nor is it consoling, especially when decisions are being made with inadequate data. There seems to be no solid ground not to err on the side of caution, and the large, loss of a large supply of public water is not only a public health issue, but an environmental justice issue. And I say importantly um, about Dr. Ballesteri and his influence on this at the, the meeting in Northampton that um, Selectman Barnes and I attended, Mr. Chairman, is that he taught the senior EPA uh, representative in Boston. In other words, that, that scientist was a student of Dr. Ballestero. And uh, if you weren't there, uh, you missed him essentially holding school again, um, both for um, water suppliers and, and for the scientific data. So it's, it's a very, very serious issue. I congratulate you on your, your merger and your, your uh, Eversource um, partnership now with that ownership. But um, I have heard people very close to um, your company uh, say that they didn't think earlier in the year that blending was a go good idea. And, and I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, it, it's still there. You can use an alcohol acronym, you can uh, uh, euphemism, whatever you want to use. Um, but, uh, you know, if someone's going 100 miles an hour uh, and 100% of these one person on the road, uh, you know, 100% of the people are going that fast, and it's dangerous. And if you put 100 people out in that road, uh, it gets more dangerous because... There's 99 more people, and there's still one person uh, doing the 100 miles an hour. So I don't like that. That's just me. Um, uh, we pay for a lawyer. It's important that when we have these meetings that his, his, uh, his information is heard, and he can say it much better than I can. I'm a layman. Uh, Messner is doing great work in Concord. And I guess, Mr. Chairman, I'll wrap up because I've been talking about this for a long time, is that we support uh, Eversource and Aquarian. We support your, uh, your attempts at solutions, and we would ask that you work closely with uh, um, our scientists uh, for these issues. And, and I personally am opposed to uh, um, the blending, uh, and I think that when you had your, um, your hearings with the PUC, uh, that Attorney Gerald and I spoke, and the chairman of the PUC said that we have direct courses of action that we can pursue with them to protect our interest in, in, in filings or, or legal actions or hearings. And I think it would be prudent for the board to do that if we're not satisfied uh, with the courses of action that, that you're taking, which would exclude uh, blending. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to go over a couple of things that, number one, the water that's being delivered right now is below the, the most conservative standards in, in the country. Is that true? John, do you want to address yeah. that? So that would be the slide. That's what that slide depicts. That's, that slide shows, that it's below New Jersey who's lowering it to the lowest that there is. So anybody receiving water today is receiving safe water. There's, there's yeah, no so question. None right. of the standards that have it's been proposed are zero, and 14 is the lowest one that I'm aware of, 15 different states plus EPA. Okay. All right. And if it was blending, the blending, again, would be below, even with well six on, on it would be below what is the most conservative standard. And, I, you know, I just think that you've got to go with science, that you've got to go with the science that's available right now. And if you start, if you start trying to solve every problem that doesn't exist, it's not going to help. So that's my opinion on it. And I, and I just want people to know that they're receiving safe water right now. As far as anybody knows, the water is safe according to all standards. So, and I think you guys have been very transparent. I think Aquarian has been very transparent, has dealt, has come to all the meetings, has come with all the information, has agreed to do all the testing, has gone above and below. 
So uh, be above and beyond. <laughs> so <laughs> below. <laughs> Sorry. So thank you very much. If anybody else has any other questions, Regina, go. Yeah, I want to mirror what Jim said about how you guys are going above and beyond. And I also understand, I was up there today, and we talked about blending. And blending, to me, wasn't going to be the way we were going to treat this. It was going to be what we did until we decide to, one, either treat, we could treat well six, and then we could blend. Correct. And I think, so maybe if perhaps you could get together with Tom Ballestero and maybe work on some of this together. I mean, I know my ultimate would be to have scenario three, but I don't think that Aquarian should have to pay 5.7 million, and I don't think that the ratepayer should have to pay 5.7 million either. I think the polluter should have to pay it, and we don't know who the polluter is right now. That's just the way it is. So I just wanted to make that clarification as to where I was coming from, and I hope the board understands that. Anybody else? Yeah, I've got a follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm looking at the data, and there was an assertion by the chair that um, that current levels or most recent levels don't meet the New Jersey levels. If you can look to page 4, you've got on that, you've got the Vermont 20, and you've got 14. Is that correct? Okay. Then you go to page 5, you look at the Mill Road N4 on 28 August. That appears to be 15. Is that correct? In the red? That is total PFCs. Okay. That, so total PFCs is not regulated in New Jersey standard or anybody's standard. Okay. It's the PFOA and PFOS. Okay. And... Page number six, the well that we've shut down, we've lost 65 million bucks of uh, capacity, 65 million gallons. Comment on, on those limits that you intend or, or, or perhaps are pursuing a course of action that you would blend those. So the data that Dan showed is when you blend those six wells together, as is, the max level would be 11. Okay, and where's, where's the 11 on, on page number six? That's on page 13. Okay, so on page number 6, we're, we're, we're looking at limits that are approaching 30 in well number 6. Is that correct? That's PFOA plus PFOS. Okay. So and, and if you add New Jersey's 14 per PFOA and 13 proposed for mm -hmm. PFOS, that's 27. Okay. Okay, so we're right around there before we blend. Okay, so... We blend, it dro drops it down. At that well number 6... And we've got five other wells right around well number six. And you've just heard Dr. Ballesteros' comments. And my comfort level uh, is, is much different than the chair's. Is uh, um, you're, you're higher than New Jersey, and you're going to blend that with, with good water. Page number seven. Talk to me about what that number looks at on well number six. I see close to 120. I see 80. Tell me what those numbers are about, please. Those are the total PFCs, so the total of the nine PFCs okay. that have been detected. And how do those compare, those numbers that are pushing 120, 80, 70? What, how do those compare with New Jersey? So New Jersey does not, ha or no state that I'm aware of and EPA, no state has a standard for total PFCs. Okay. They've set a standard, uh, <coughs> New Jersey being the most conservative, PFOA, PFOS, and PFNA. Okay. Proposed. These PFCs, are, are they carcinogens? Uh, I'm not qualified to answer that. I, I don't think they have determined uh, for more than two or three of them. Uh, the health scientists, the toxicologists, I don't think they have made that determination. PFOA, I believe they have said, is carcinogen. Okay. And did you shut down well number six because you were confident that they weren't carcinogens? We shut down well number six out of, of an abundance of caution because we didn't have enough information about uh, the levels that the well was producing and what levels were deemed safe. So now it's, uh, so that was in August. So it's several months past there. A lot more information has come out. Okay, great. Now. And finally, going with the science, these are emerging, th <laughs> emerging threats, and I think it's important uh, that everybody be on their toes. And uh, there are new, and you, I see you nodding your head, is that we lean forward and uh, we're aggressive about it. And if we're relying on science, science is evolving. 
these were undetected. These were emerging threats that nobody knew about, and nobody was ill-intended on it. Um, but, but going with the science is a, is a changing game almost <coughs> on, a, on a daily basis, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to say, uh, ever since uh, the board and um, my office were informed in this, this summer that there was this level of contamination in well six, uh, this board has been very vigorous in uh, our approach both to uh, encouraging further monitoring to find out what is the source of this contamination as well as being vigorous in um, uh, encouraging treatment uh, in the meantime. And uh, as part of that, Aquarian uh, and the towns of Hampton and Northampton uh, entered into an agreement at the beginning of August uh, to, to further the monitoring effort as well as to uh, <coughs> explore the treatment possibilities. And I, I do want to thank Aquarian. I'm not always on the same side of issues with them for this board, but I do want to thank them for, for also following up on, on that agreement uh, to the letter. And so now, as I understand it, in the month of January, we will be uh, able to provide input to Aquarian <laughs> as to whether there would be a go or no-go with response to uh, these treatment modalities that have been mentioned. And so this, this board's opinions on that subject I know will be heard by Aquarian and will be followed up on. And I think the public uh, can have a, a confidence that the board anyway, uh, unlike EPA appears to it sometimes, is, is aggressively pursuing this contaminate this emerging contamination and what to do about it. Um, as Selectman Bean mentioned, uh, Mr. Ba Dr. Ballestero did appear November 15th at the Northampton Town Office and gave a very um, reasoned presentation, very well informed presentation, and uh, today has submitted in writing as they requested. Uh, EPA itself requested his comments and he has given those in writing. We've provided those to Aquarian as well. And also we have offered Dr. Ballesteros assistance to Aquarian because EPA also mentioned that they would like to meet with Aquarian uh, to, uh, to explore uh, what, we would what they would like to see in terms of further monitoring wells to find out whether Coakley is the source of the contamination. And so uh, we have offered Dr. Ballas Ballesteros assistance to Aquarian uh, and, and hope they will take advantage of that. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, gentlemen. If there's nothing else you want to present, if there's no other questions, we appreciate right. you coming in. We appreciate your uh, concern. Well, thank you for thank having you us. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, approval of minutes, November 20th, 2017. So moved. Okay. Second. All in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. Town Manager's Report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, the gates of the Ashworth Avenue parking lot are open and the lot is available in accordance with the board's previous vote. I will comment that we had some trouble keeping them open. The wind was giving us a lot of trouble last uh, last week and uh, actually flung the gates out into Ashworth Avenue. The breakdown lane and the sidewalk was unusable because of it. Wow. We had to actually chain them open and tie them down. So they are open and they will stay open until the board issues some other order. Uh, submission of petitioned zoning warrant articles are due by December 13th. That's the last day they may be submitted. And submission of all other petition warrant articles are due January 9th, except for articles dealing with bonding, which have to be in by January 5th. Please remember that uh, street parking is not permitted from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. daily. Uh, if you have bags of leaves um, that have not been picked up, please call Public Works. Uh, we have a forecast for uh, flurries this weekend, and uh, I always get nervous when somebody says flurries. I remember Don Kent's forecast for flurries that ended up being three and a half feet, but uh, hopefully nothing of that nature will occur. Uh, so this will probably be the last week that we'll be picking anything up by request. Uh, please remember <clears throat> to remove your trash and recycling containers and your movable basketball hoops out of the street. It makes it extremely difficult for us to plow the roads if they are actually in the driven way. And Mr. Chairman, we, uh, 
just for the board's knowledge, and I think everybody else's knowledge, if you happen to see some trappers working uh, around Ice Pond and uh, around Mill Pond, we have hired a trapper. Uh, as much as we try to keep those areas clean so the water will flow and, and, and we can do the work that's necessary in those particular areas, uh, our little Army Corps of Engineers beavers that they used on the Alcan Highway in Alaska are very busy trying to dam up as fast as we try to clear out. So uh, they're, they're very efficient. Unfortunately, their dams don't last as long as the ones we build, but uh, they are up there, and, and we have a few that we're going to have to trap out. We did open bids, Mr. Chairman, this past week for the Mill Pond Dam, and we had eight bidders, which was very good. The bids came in uh, a little more than $70,000, $70,089 over the amount of the appropriation. So uh, after consultation with Public Works, it was trying to work, try, still trying to work figures out. It looks like it would require a petition to article of about $100,000 to get the project completed. And uh, we'll see. The original project was a petition article, so we're contacting the petitioners and seeing if they're going to submit something of that nature. <coughs> That's it, sir. Thank you. Questions for the town manager? Regina. No, thank you. Rusty. No. Nope. Rick. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Lady. Thanks for your report. <laughs> Old business, warrant articles. Mr. Chairman, we have a number of warrant articles uh, that we'd like the board to consider and see if we can't dispose of. You had a, originally approved um, the paralegal for the legal department. Uh, with your permission, we would like to uh, finish that particular warrant article and submit the final draft to the board for final approval and vote and put that into the, into the queue uh, for this, this coming uh, event of the town meeting for okay. 2018. The same with the town clerk's assistant. Uh, we have a draft board article, and with your permission, we'd like to complete that and get that done. Uh, it's important that we get those things out of the way. And we still have the DPW vehicle purchase requirements. Uh, would you like to have the Public Works Department come in and discuss those with you? We don't have much time left to do that. Yeah. Um, yes. I, it, well, yeah, Rusty? Sure. Yes. It looks like yes. Okay. DPW. Then we will schedule them for your next meeting, okay. sir. Um, so you want to do those other articles now? Uh, I'm just looking for permission to uh, to draft the final document and to bring it forward to you. If you're still willing to do them, you did order us to do yep. them. So we will draft that. We will bring them into your next meeting for your final approval. Okay. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. What have you said, also, Chairman? Sounds good. We okay. also have one that about manpower. For the police That's, department, I mean for the fire department? That one is currently under study. We have talked to the uh, state. Uh, they do not expect to have those documents ready until March. The, for the grants? Yes. Should we have a warrant article that's in place that's stipulant? We stipulates if we, if we can get the grants, then we can <coughs> proceed with that? We can draw so that warrant article for the board's approval. So we don't have to wait for another year just to... We, what comes in in March, and it's the same time our election yeah. is. Right. You know, we should have a warrant article that, if, if it's available, that we're able to go get we it. We can certainly draft that. I found out today that, that, that we'll, we don't expect those to be available until March, after town meeting time. Okay. So we'll draft that and bring that back next week, too. Okay. Super. And I also think we ought to have a, uh, a motion on, we talked a lot last summer about the entertainment article, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we... Uh, you know, I think we, we talked a lot about the police chief being involved with that. I think we ought to have a motion that uh, directs the police chief to present the board amendments to the entertainment ordinance so we can have a warrant article so that people can have a chance to vote on this. So you're making a motion? I can make that a motion. Would you? Sure. <laughs> I'll make that a motion that that we, uh, we, we have the chief or direct the chief to present the board amendments to the enter, uh, to the entertainment ordinance regarding noise levels. Okay. Well, I'll second that, but we need him to come in and discuss okay. it. Okay. Yes. So, all in favor? Uh, just a little discussion. Yeah. Okay. Discussion. Go. Pardon me. And is is that in, uh, is there a court challenge to the current one now? No. No. There is no. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Roger. No. Just <laughs> no. no. Okay. Thank you, Mr. That Chairman. That was pulled away. So. All in favor? 
All right, so we will have him draw something up, and he will come in and discuss it with us. We'll plan on having that done next week so that you can you can have a little lead time here. Okay. You only get two more meetings after yep. this week. Yep. Uh, we also have, uh, and Jamie Sullivan will be back for your next meeting. He has a draft article for information technology upgrades, okay. which has been discussed a number of times by the board. So we should also get that one done, and he will be here to explain that next week. Okay. Anything else under warrant articles? Anybody? Okay. So what is the final um, warrant article about the $15 million one? Is it going to be 13.8 or is it going to be 15? The 13.8 is what the, what the consultants recommended. If you read the report, you will see that if, in fact, you do the $13.8 million, you're going to go back and rip some of the things out that you've done in order to do some of the things in Phase 2 and, say, Phase 3. So we put a little extra money in there so we wouldn't do that. We'd get them all done in Phase 1 instead of coming back and doing something different with the building in Phases 2 and 3. So it's a contingency. You might say we, we can do it with $13.8 million and just move forward. I personally would rather see it to be 13.8. That make a difference to us. Anybody else? Oh, are we voting on that tonight? Did did our finance director go to the? Um... She did, and she will have something for you next week. So okay. next week we could vote yeah. on that. Yes. Rather than tonight, okay. And we'll have thirteen point eight million drafted into the into the warrant article. So you could have a look at that. We'll also look at it both ways. We'll also be prepared to address the fifteen million. Fifteen million. Right. I think that would be yeah. smart. Yes. Yeah. And we can discuss that. Anything else under warrant articles? Seeing nothing. Let's move to Exeter Hamp. Exeter Hampton sewer agreement. We did receive a response back from our good friends in Exeter uh, with regards to the sewer agreement. Uh, as you perhaps noticed from the information that we handed out to you, uh, we're on two different systems. We bill on property tax, they bill on an enterprise fund based upon certain assumptions. Um, they've suggested that uh, at the very worst, they bill quarterly. Uh, the very worst that uh, we would they would bill us ha half a year through, and that that represents having to adjust things in their billing rate. I'd rather not do that because people make mistakes in those calculations. Just have them send us the bill. We'll pay the bill, and, and it'll be done. Uh, we realize that they're in basically the same position we're in, except much worse. They have to spend something in excess of seventy million to redo their plant, and that's why their rates have gone up. Uh, our rates are staying the same because it's on the tax rate. So it's a, it's a matter of they're the only show in town. We have to provide the service through them to our citizens who are up there on our system. So what do you need from us? Uh, just an approval to do what they have asked us to do, basically. I would move that we support Mr. Welch's uh, 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 assertion that we uh, uh, include the changes proposed by the Exeter in the agreement and his letter dated 29-2017 to the Board of Selection. Second. Okay, a little discussion on it. I just want to say that <coughs> Exeter does it. They had to build a new plant. Yes. So what they did was raise their rates. Yep. Because they have an enterprise fund. That's correct. So they... And, and let, me, let me say something that just to kind of qualify that, because when you look at enterprise funding, you have an option. Uh, they have the option of including it within their rate for the bonding. Town meeting has the option to not do that and to include it as a general obligation of the town. So as you do this study and you move forward with studying these things, we have to look at it from two, two perspectives. Okay. And that's, that's what Selectman Barnes had asked, that we go in to look at the enterprise fund yes. pretty yes. closely and then yep. we decide whether that would be a way to move. So I just think it's interesting. Well, I've it looked is. at the way Exeter has it set up, but I don't think that's necessarily how you have to set it up. No, that's it isn't. the way they chose to set it <coughs> That's correct. And I think we're at sort of an entirely different mm -hmm. type of community here. Yep. So we it are. would definitely be much different than it, the okay, way it works. We'll, we'll look at it both ways so you have both definitely. figures. Definitely. Right. Okay. Very good. I think it's important for people to realize, too, that um, by doing it one way, the people can deduct it from their taxes, and they do it another way, they can't. That's correct. And that's an important factor yep. for many people. Yep. It is. I just wanted to say that this is in the form of an intergovernmental agreement, so that ultimately, even after both towns selectmen approve of it, there is a um, attorney general's approval that comes into okay. play as well. Do we have to vote on this? No. Just no, we will do the final draft. We'll get that to you for your approval. Okay. We're all set on that. Thank you. Uh, anything else under old business anybody else has? Uh, what I would like to say is that last week we, uh, or this week, we have 
finalized the assistant town manager's uh, report. Last week we said we had finalized the town manager's report. We've now finalized the assistant town manager's report, and it runs out until July 2020. And at, at a certain time on there, and this is all in the town clerk's office, there will be a change where the assistant town manager will become the town manager and the, assist, and the town manager will become the assistant town manager and go to part-time. And if anybody would like to add anything to that, they're welcome to. Regina? Um, nope. I'm uh, very, <coughs> my mind is at ease knowing that both Jamie and Fred are in place. Good choices on both of them. Fred? Uh, Phil? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership in, in those contract negotiations for both Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Welch, and uh, we're glad to have both of them uh, accepting our, our offer and ours to accept their acceptance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and the only statement I would like to make is we went out to three years with both individuals, and the one reason, one reason for that is that stability is a really important thing over the next three years, that we have people in place who know what's going on, and we don't have new people coming in with all the infrastructure problems we're having with the contracts that are going to be coming up, with the bonds that mm -hmm. are going to be coming up, with the, you know, all the, we just needed stability, and we needed people who knew what the town was doing and had a history with the town for the three years, and that's what we have, and we're very pleased with it. So thank you. Uh, new business, anybody else under old business? Yep. One, one quick thing, and yep. it, was, it, was, it was mentioned tonight, but it is old business. I would move that we uh, uh, put uh, Dr. Ballesteros, uh letter dated today to the town selectman on the uh, um, town website under documents. Second. All in favor? Unanimous, okay. no problem. Thank you. Moving on to new business, 2017 annual report front and back cover. I'd like to um, accept the... Christina's uh, report for the front and the back. I think they look great. Having a relative on there, I'll second that. All right. <laughs> and do you want to explain what it is just so the public knows? We've all seen Certainly. it. And we've all looked yeah. at it. The, the front cover will be a, uh, a picture of the World War I and other wars monument that's on the front of the library. Uh, it's very decorative. It's very pretty. Uh, and the back cover will be all of the World War I heroes that were photographed on November 11th, 1919, here in town at a gathering. So I think that's, it's very impressive, and we, we have been able to get all of their names and put them on the, on the back page. What, which is your relative, Rusty? Marvin Young. It's my grandfather. Yeah, the... Uh, Long-time town employee. That, the one that's uh, Staniel Hussey, he's the one that would be related to that Princess Markle or whatever her name is. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I think it's a great cover and a great it's uh, good, back good. page. Uh, and do we, we need a vote on that, right? No? No, just if, if you say no, we'll do something else. But <laughs> I think everybody's on it. All right, two, ambulance bid waivers from purchasing policy and purchasing procedures, section 718-4B, one, exceeding $50,000, two, less than three bidders, and 718.5.1 policy waiver. Are these ones we discussed last week, or...? No, we, we did not. Uh, we, we've gone out to bid for the ambulance, which we do every, every three years. Uh, the new ambulance uh, was bid out, and uh, yes, it's in excess of the amount that's required to be approved by the board. Uh, there was a successful low bidder, uh, $234,931, uh, and we, it's, a, uh, it's a brand new ambulance. We need to replace a 2009 ambulance, so uh, that would be the, uh, the price that we need to pay for that on the, on the bid. And there were less than three bidders? There were less than three. Okay. Yeah. There's only, I believe, I may be wrong, but Rusty can correct me or not, there's only four principal manufacturers. Yeah, there's only three or four now yeah. that, that build ambulances, so. Okay. Any discussion on this? Do we have a motion? I'll make the motion that we uh, go with the recommended bid that the uh, they came up with for the... Too much, too many words. 234? 234, 934, 931. 931. Yeah. Okay. Second. All right. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Uh, 
Mark, it looks like you want to say something. Uh, yes, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Before the board closes, I would appreciate uh, a uh, motion to go into a non-public session under RSA 91 hyphen capital A colon 3 Roman 2 small e uh, consideration or negotiation of pending claims or litigation. Make the motion. Second. Roll call. Regina. Aye. Aye. Bill. Brick, myself. Thank you. And may I, Mr. Chairman, just on some concrete business, uh, two quick things. Yeah. Uh, John Nyan and I were at the uh, State Parks Advisory Council meeting last week. Uh, great work by John. Great work by the director and the commissioner. It was interesting. Other communities have some of the challenges we do. That will be uh, uh, very fruitful for the town of Hampton. Tomorrow, uh, a poignant uh, meeting uh, with the uh, Seacoast Cancer Cluster Investigation. That will be Rennie Cushing and myself will be up there. Uh, the... Uh, CLG will be on board. We'll be requesting data from them in addition to what has already been requested from Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, so we're into non-public. Thank you, Channel 22.